Hi, I'm Matt Bell. I'm really excited to be here at MCC today uh, reading through my books and talking to students about writing. I'm the author of two novels, Scrapper and In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, and the new short story collection, A Tree or a Person or a Wall. Um, my, my, uh, my work's about, I think, a, a lot of different things, a lot of different kinds of stories. I'm really interested in, um, in doing a range of different styles and topics. I'm often, I think, writing about um, different kinds of, of masculinity, different kinds of ways of dealing with fear or loss or grief, um, and certainly interested in telling stories in sort of new and, and interesting ways. Um, one of the things that was really great about being here today was getting to talk to students about their own stories, about their own wants to, to sort of change the world with the narratives they're making. Um, it's really exciting to think about the way that student uh, stories uh, will not only be in the classroom here, but sort of go beyond that into the lives they're leading as, as writers and artists and thinkers and the effects that they're going to have in the future. What were some obstacles you had to overcome when you were starting off? Yeah, I think um, there's obstacles I didn't know were obstacles at the time, like uh, like I hadn't read enough. <laughs> I just had to read more books, I had to read more stuff, I had to write more. Um, so I didn't know that I didn't have some of that foundation yet for me. Um, I think as, as maybe some of you have, hopefully none of you have this, um, my parents were not super keen on the idea that I would go to school to be a creative writer. I hear some like, you're right, like some of us have that. So that was a thing that I had to sort of deal with. Um, I dropped out of college a couple times. I was a very slow college student. Um, I finished my undergrad, I was 26. Um, I went to a, I had a full ride before your school. I started, uh, uh, I started out as a pre-law student, then I was a computer science student, then I dropped out. I just stopped going half of the semester, that's not the best way to leave school. Um, and then I kind of went back and forth. I was bartending and I would take credits when I could afford it. And if I could take 12 credits and I couldn't work enough, and like I would have these, and then like the next semester I would take three, and it was always this thing. Um, so it was that, like it just took a long time for me to get some of my ducks in a row. Um, and I think one of the hardest things for me was that I had no community when I was starting out. Like I was writing in a, in a rural town in Michigan, um, not even as a writer, like as a reader. Like I started reading contemporary literary fiction and it was like, like I was like discovering these people from like a, like a foreign land. I was like, right, I was the only person who ever read these books I could find anyone to talk to them about. Um, and I got lucky to find, this is 2001, 2002, to find some like online communities. And I found some kind of like-minded people, other people were trying to write, other people were reading books. At, and that really sustained me until I um, really until I went to grad school and was sort of immersed um, in that, that kind of environment. I went to grad school in 2008 when I was 28. Um, and the year before that, I was managing a, a Mongolian barbecue in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, as you do in your path of being a writer. And um, I, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to write a novel. So I, one of my things was that to write a novel, you must have to work like every day. Like it must be like, you must have to stay in it. Um, and so I would get my managing schedule like a month at a time. And my initial goal was that I would schedule five writing sessions a week, two hours each around that. So work seven to five and write seven to nine or something. Um, and that, it's always worked pretty well for me. Like once I sort of started building that habit, uh, and then grass switched to mornings, um, that's been pretty good. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, before I, I uh, think of it somewhat like exercise, like if you go like, uh, if you exercise every day, you can take like two days off and you go back and the gym still feel pretty strong. If you take like two weeks off, it's like you start over. And I think some of that's for me, so I try to stay in it. Um, uh, but I think there's lots of ways. It's just like whatever works for you, whatever gets the work done. What about you? What's your... Yeah, well, I'm just curious because I'm uh, actually a similar story. I was on uh, a for a while. Sorry, now I'm a high school teacher. Mm. So just by the time you get home, right. it's so difficult. Like, it's unbelievable. And I'm trying to find a second job, sadly, because of pay. Sure. Part time you again. So it's like, where do I really fit it in? And I feel kind of guilty, you know, almost. Well, so. then I'll just say yeah. this. If you write 15 minutes a day, yeah. it's more than, than you were when you weren't doing it all, right? Yeah. Like, great books get written 15 minutes a day, great yeah. stories, great poems. Um, you fit it where you can fit it. Uh, I, was a, I was a community college student for, for three years with bartending and was married and had these things. And, and I know, right? Like some days, I have like, right now I have a really good situation where I get to have that work time. So, so you're teaching still? Yeah, I teach at Arizona State. Oh, um, okay. I have a good program there. But, uh, but wherever you can work, right? Yeah. Like, so if, if 10 minutes is all you can do, if all you can do is write a couple lines, that's great. Um, the rule I have for myself now is days I'm traveling, days I'm doing other things, days I'm busy, days there's an election the night before, and we get really tired. Um, like, like if I touch it, like go in and make one thing better. That's always my goal, to make one thing better on the thing I'm working at. 
So at least that, right? Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, man. I think one of the reasons I'm a writer is, is Dennis Johnson's book, uh, Jesus the Sun, which for some of you who know. Um, and uh, so it's funny, Mike, Mike, we've never talked about that. We'll talk about it. Um, I'm so excited. Um, but there's a story in there, they're called Work, and, and that I really love. And there's, a, and there's a part in that story where um, the two guys in the story have spent all day stealing metal from like a house. They're like, they're junkies, and they're stealing metal from a house, and they, they sell it. And they go to the bar, and they have this feeling of like, like that they're men who have worked. Like their bodies are exhausted, they're men who work. And I, and I just had this like deep recognition with that at a time when I felt like I was not bad. I was sort of like this person who didn't know what I was supposed to be. And it was that feeling of, oh, somebody else feels the way I feel, or someone else has that feeling. Like, that's what we're looking for. So like the things that you feel that you think no one else feels, that's the stuff, right? Um, so just move toward that. And like I think the rest falls in line. The work that, that succeeded, the work that first got like in magazines, that first became my first books, was um, the stuff that was most personal. I think this, you hear this sometimes in class, but I think it's absolutely true that if you try to write toward the universal, like something everyone will like, that sort of fails, it's always really flat. If you write toward like your particular, the thing that only you sort of know about the world, uh, the thing that only you see, that ends up being the stuff we recognize in books. It seems true to us. I don't think either. I think um, the term I, I, I used to use a lot is sort of sort of non-realist for that kind of work, you know, which I think is really broad. Like a fairy tale is non-realist, like a fantasy is non-realist, science fiction is non-realist. It's broad. I like that. Um, I'm not super attached to sort of the genre labels. Um, I think a lot about defamiliarization, about making something strange. Uh, David Foster Wallace has this thing that he said, said uh, in an interview once, and he's quoting somebody else so I can never remember. Um, and every time I say that, I think I'm going to look that up when I get home so I can quote it right, but I won't. Um, and he said that the task of the writer used to be to go out into the unfamiliar world, the strange world, and bring it back to the reader by making it, making it familiar. That you take the strange, you make it familiar. You take the foreign, you make it familiar so that the reader can recognize it. And then David Foster Wallace was saying, um, now the task is that everything is familiar. Everything is hard to see. There's all the stuff we, we can't look at well or we have trouble seeing, sort of reality we don't want to look at. And so the task is to make the familiar make it strange. So like a topic like, say, uh, like climate change, which is really hard to think about, really hard to feel in sort of a felt way. Um, we sort of hear these facts so they don't always move us the way they should, probably. Um, a task as a writer might be to like defamiliarize that enough so it could be felt as if it was new. Um, the, my first novel, uh, my first novel is a book called In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, which is this like weird myth about like marriage and parenthood where people are like seeing second moons in the sky and fighting giant bears, and there's like a ghost child that lives inside the father. And like it's pretty weird, but like one of the one of the ways that thing works, I think, is that it takes something like as, as sort of every day is like um, parenthood or marriage and makes it super strange so that the like emotions of it are, are accessible. They like sneak up on you because you're, you're like, oh, what's going on with this giant bear, right? Instead of like being like, oh, it's a story about being a dad, right? Um, so some of that, is, that's more what I think about. It's like, how can I estrange this enough so that the reader will approach it completely fresh? It will bring preconceptions to it. And whether that's in a more realist treatment or in a more non-realist, it doesn't matter to me that much. Although I like giant bears and seeing movies in the sky, so I'm pro more of that. One of the books you'll read least in your life is your own, thankfully, um, so you won't always know where things are. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning like, uh, that a lot of what I write about is, um, is this sort of toxic uh, masculinity, um, and, uh, and I thought maybe I don't want to read that tonight, so I'm going to read just a really short, couple page story about a, a woman who's, uh, who's pregnant and is uncertain and is thinking about these sort of kind of fantastical imaginings of what her, her child might be um, as a way of sort of dealing with that anxiety. Um, the story called her Aeneid, and Aeneid is just a, a fancy word for a set of nine, so the story is in nine parts. Her baby is a joke, a tiny bundle of cells dividing, too small to be taken seriously. For another week or two, it will still be smaller than the benign tumor she had removed from her breast two years ago. A realization that at least you're touching the place where that lump once was. She jokes about this to her friends who don't find it funny. She doesn't either, but she can't stop herself from sharing about her tumor-sized baby growing and growing, taking over her body. 
This time, no one wants to stop it or get rid of it. This time, people say congratulations and hug her instead of pretending she's contagious, instead of forgetting her number till they hear she's better. Like before, she's only angry because everyone always, sorry, like before, she's only angry because everyone always assumes they already know exactly how she feels. She is careful to keep her true feelings to herself, to see that, as with the tumor, there is much she could lose. Her baby is a seed, barely planted, but already pushing roots through its waxy coat, searching for the dank soil it needs to grow inside her. She pictures it flowering, but knows it will be years before the baby is old enough for flowers, for seeds of its own. Her doctor emphasized nutrition, suggests she, suggests she drink six to eight glasses of water every day. At home, she holds her face under the faucet, her throat tight open to swallow all the water she can. When she stands, her face and neck and shirt are soaked through. She puts her lips back to the flowing water and drinks again as deep as she can, as deep as she knows she must. Her baby is a stone, cool and dark, something formed not in an instant, as she always assumed her baby would be, but instead over an age, an epoch. Everything about her pregnancy progresses slower than she'd imagined it would. She pictures her stones skipping across the hidden darkness of a lake, each point of contact, a ripple expanding and then disappearing. She practices skipping stones herself while she waits for the baby to come, transforming every ditch and puddle and pond and lake into a microcosm, into a point of departure, a possible place where one day she will have to let go. Her baby is a thunderstorm, a bundle of negatively and positively charged ions about to interact violently. It is a hurricane, or a monsoon, or a tsunami. You have a particularly thunderstorm child. <laughs> it is a hurricane, or a monsoon, or a tsunami, but she doesn't know which, doesn't know how to tell the difference. She feels it churning inside, growing stronger with each revolution. What happens after the baby comes will be different than what happened before. This is storm as cataclysm. Whole countries she once knew will be swept away, their inhabitants scattered and replaced by new citizens, other mothers and other children whose company she knows she will spend the rest of her life. Her baby is a bird modeled with gray and brown feathers that will last only until the end of its infancy when it will mold into splendor. Its mouth is wide open, waiting expectantly. Sometimes, when she lies still in her quiet apartment, she can hear cawing from her round belly. She has cravings, contemplates eating quarters, little bits of tin foil, even a pair of silver earrings. She hopes her baby is building a beautiful nest inside of her. She wants to give it everything it needs so that it might never leave. This is nest as lie, as false hope, her baby is a bird of prey, something she has never been this close to before. All those talons, all that beef, it hooks her, devours her. They're both so hungry, she eats and eats. Before this, she never knew birds had tongues. Her baby is a knife, a dagger, a broadsword, broadsword, sharp and terrible. Her baby is dangerous, and if she isn't careful, then one day it will hurt her, hurt others. When it kicks, she feels its edges pressed against the walls of its sheep, drawing more blood in a sea of blood. She is careful when she walks not to bump into solid objects, not to put herself in harm's way. She wonders how it will hurt to push it from her body, to have the doctor tug the baby from her body as from a stone. Her baby is a fur thing, alternately bristled and then soft. She hopes it isn't shedding, wonders how she'll ever get all that hair out of her if it is. She searches online for images of badgers and then wolverines, looking for something to recognize in their faces. She types the words, creatures that burrow, then adds a question mark and tries again. The baby is so warm inside her, curled in on itself, waiting for winter to end, for a day to come, when all the breath it's been holding can finally be expelled, like heat fogging the air of a still cold morning. Sometimes, when the baby rolls over and makes itself known, she can almost smell it. 
now the water breaking, now the dilation of the cervix, now the first real contraction, more potent than any of the false warnings she experienced before, now the worry that this is too early, that she hasn't learned yet what her baby is supposed to be, now the lack of thought and the loss of discernible time, now the pain which is sharp and dull and fast and slow, which is both waves and particles at the same time. Now the hurry, the burst in emotion after the near year of waiting. Now the push, the pushing, the rushing stretch of her suddenly elastic body expanding to do this thing, to give birth to this baby. Now the joke, the seed, the stone, the storm, the bird, the sword. Now the tiny mammal, warm-blooded and hot, and yes, now the head covered in wet hair, now the shoulders, now the torso and the arms, now the hip bones and the thighs and the knees and the feet, now the first breath, now the eyes opening, now the cry calling out to her like deja vu, like the recognition of someone from a dream, now the baby, now the baby, now the baby, an event repeating for the rest of her life. Her baby is a boy, her baby is a girl, her baby is potential energy changing the kinetic, is a person gaining momentum. Her baby is a possibility, or rather a string of possibilities and potentialities stretching forward from her towards something still unknowable. With a baby in her arms, she smiles, she coos, she tells her baby it can be whatever it wants to be. She tells her baby that no matter what it turns out to be, she will always recognize it when it comes back to her. There was no shape that could hide her baby from her, no form that would make her turn her back on it. She says this like a promise, swears it like she can make it true, like it's just that easy. Some days, no matter what she says, her baby cries and cries and cries. What's your typical writing process like? Is it very regimented? Is it spontaneous? Or? I think uh, it's regimented in pursuit of the spontaneous, is that fair? Um, yeah, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty, like, uh, like I try to work um, every day for a couple hours in the morning. I, uh, these days I sort of get up and I go for a run and come back, eat breakfast and I work. I try to work till about lunch. I've been really lucky to live for a couple years in a way where, uh, as a teacher and before that as an editor, where I was able to write in the mornings and do most of my other work in the afternoon. Um, for me, that works really well. One of the things that animates a lot of my, my fiction is that characters set out to try to deal with some kind of emotion or trauma or um, or fear by trying to either build like a story around it or like a structure sort of contain it. Sometimes really literally, um, and or they or they're at a place where they're taking on like a role. And then like so in like the story I just read, the woman takes on the story of being a mother and like preparing for that. So the story is about that. And that he takes on the story of sort of being a detective, this role. And then the story becomes about him like sort of fulfilling that. So once I had that idea that he would try to solve this kind of unsolvable crime that he was still suited for, then a lot of the rest is sort of cause and effect from that. One of the things that's hardest for me about nonfiction writing is baked into the way we tell stories about ourselves, which is like I think for most of us, like if I say like, uh, how was your day? Or how was your weekend? Or what, what happened to you? You come home and you're like, you won't believe what happened to me at work. We tell like two basic stories, and one is in which we're the hero, and you won't believe this awesome thing I did. And one is in which we're the victim, like you won't believe what my asshole boss did, right? And like those are like the two basic stories of like our anecdotes. But but that's not good enough for sort of nonfiction. Like it's not good enough for fiction. Like you have to be able to look at yourself more objectively, not as a hero or a victim, but as a, as a sort of fully agented actor in your own life. And that was the hardest part. I had to do that over and over again. I, would go, I had to take out that sort of either self-pitying or self-laudatory or, or do that. And I think the other part was um, trying not to inflate even really small things to try to let things be the important as they actually were. Um, to use the real language of like my life. Like, uh, like in my stories, a character, I often use kind of an inflated, like high language. Um, in my stories, people are, have like mothers and fathers, right? And like, I had like a mom and a dad. And like even that kind of editorial stuff at the, at the line level is about being honest about it, right? Like, I'd be writing these things like, when I was 10, my mother, and I'm like, that's crap, that's not true. My mom, right? These little tiny things, like, to use the actual language of your life. Um, 
And I've been thinking about what that means for, for fiction a little bit as well. I think part of the reason to be a reader and a writer is, part of the reason to be a read is to, reader is to increase the empathy we have for people who have lives that are different than ours. So part of the reason to be a writer has to be that too, like to enter a character as an act of empathy. And so to imagine yourself in the role of somebody else is to think about what they would care about, what they would be concerned about. I think one of the reasons we end up othering so many people is that we, we think other people are more different than they are, right? And that goes across gender lines, goes across class, goes across ethnicity, right? Um, we don't want to steal other people's experiences, but at the same time, Speak I think, for them. yeah, but I think to try to inhabit a point of view that's not yours is a, is a radical act of empathy that, I mean, you know, if I can, if I can bring yesterday back into it again, like, the failure to put yourself in the shoes of others is a radical failure, that's a failure in our society. So I think to try to write from a different perspective is a brave and wonderful thing. Have you know from the idea that the story is a Spanish Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's hard, always, to know who's done all the work, right? Um, I think earlier, I think I was always anxious to be done, right? Like I wanted to, I wanted to be done, I wanted to be sure it was good, I wanted to be sure it was sent out, ready to send out, um, or shown to people, whatever it is. And I think somewhere a couple of years ago, I, I sort of made this mental transition. Um, I was sort of trying to be done, trying to like refuse to be done to stay in it, to do more work, to find more things to work on, to be sure to... I have, I have this kind of really intricate sort of revision process, it's probably more than, but real practical, like try this and try this and try this and try this. Um, and I think it used to, and that some of that's, like, there's a place where something's 90% done and it's good enough. And you could give it to somebody else and they'd probably like it, probably get it published, I'd be the book. Um, but what you want is that like 100%, right? You want that like, as great as you can make it. And so the anxiety became less like, Am I done? And more like, what else would I do? And then that question was different. Like, at some point, you've exhausted what you, what you can do. The pop, you know, it's not like, is this good enough? It's like, is there anything else I could, I could try? And so it changes the question. And then I think that, that makes a difference. Um, and part of that was looking at changing like, what I thought about what I was doing. Like, instead of trying to produce a product or a finished story, it was like trying to get the reward of doing the work for me and the writing, right? Um, I'm just muddying this thing about saving using the word reward there, but Jane Smiley has this quote I love um, where she says, you either love the work or the rewards, and life is a lot easier if you love the work, right? And so instead of trying to get it done to get the rewards, like stay in the work and get what you can out of that, and one day you'll go out and you can get out of that story, and then it's probably done, you know? Um, and then you'll give it to a friend, and they'll tell you it's not done, and you'll give it to an editor, and they'll tell you it's not done, and that's great, then you get to work on some more. A lot of us in the room are, are writers, a lot of us are readers, um, all of us have the potential to be to be activists. Some of us already are. Some of you already are. Um, this is not a day I woke up and felt that the world was going to be one percent beautiful. Um, but I think uh, it could be more, right? We can move through a portion. We can move the arc and change the world we're given, the world we want. Um, and I know in my own work, you know, I know my own time being. With, the, with uh, people younger than me, uh, yeah, doing it, they're going to do it, uh, and I'm going to be lucky to live in the world that they make, um, and I'm really thankful for that. So thank you so much for letting me here tonight. Uh, it was pretty thinking.